he loves the master and he follows the, the path of the master. He walks the path of the master. One of his favorite scriptures probably says it best, he is always on the Lord's errand. Thomas Spencer Monson was born on a Sunday morning, August 21st, 1927, at the old St. Mark's Hospital on 2nd West in Salt Lake City. His parents, G. Spencer and Gladys Condy Monson, were of hardy Swedish, English, and Scottish ancestry, and made a loving home for Tom, his two brothers, and three sisters. In 1927, there were just over 600,000 Latter-day Saints, most of them living in the American West. Heber J. Grant was president of the church, and in three years, the church would celebrate its 100th anniversary. Tom grew up on Salt Lake City's west side, in the midst of a close family of grandparents, aunts and uncles. His grandfather, Thomas Sharp Condy, had purchased property on the southwest corner of 5th South and 2nd West, built his own home there, and provided homes for each of his four daughters and their husbands. Tom was always welcome and totally at ease in any of their homes, never feeling the need to knock. My father did have an idyllic setting as he grew up. He loved his relatives and everything that they did for him, his aunts and uncles, it was as though he was their son as well. His mother and father were very good people. We loved them both. They loved the gospel and they have taught it to their children. My mother was a friendly, outgoing person. She would talk to people on the bus. She made friends instantly. Being around Gladys, you know, it was what they, you call a hoot, I guess. People say, Gladys, how did you raise a son to become an apostle? And she'd smile and with her own sense of humor say, well, it wasn't easy, but I persevered. My father was a hard worker. He worked 12 hours a day six days a week. He was the provider. He put the money aside so that we could have an education. Sunday was my father's only day off. I'm sure he would have enjoyed relaxing at home. But invariably he would say, come along Tommy, let's take Uncle Elias for a drive. Boarding the old 1928 Oldsmobile, we would proceed to 8th West to the home of Uncle Elias and Aunt Teen. I would wait in the car while Dad went inside. Soon he would emerge from the house, carrying his crippled uncle in his arms, like, like a little china doll. I would open the door and watch how tenderly my father would place Uncle Elias in the front seat. Then we'd take him for a ride around the city. Dad never wanted any thanks for this service. But his lesson was not lost on me. For generations, Tom's family had spent each summer at a small cabin in Vivian Park in Provo Canyon. There along the banks of the Provo River, Tom first gained from his uncles what would become a lifelong love for fishing. I would sit on the bank for hours, Tom recalled, and look at the mountainside across the river. Those were happy years, dream-filled years. One summer afternoon, 12-year-old Tom was floating on a tractor tire inner tube down the river toward its swiftest part when he heard the frantic cries of a Greek immigrant family from the bank. Just ahead in the whirlpools, a young lady swimmer was disappearing under the water for the third time. And a girl's head emerged. And I grabbed her by the hair. She'd be about 14, I suppose, and pulled her across my lap in that inner tube. While she cried and was spitting water, I took the other hand and paddled her through the whirlpool and into the little eddy and up to the bank and then handed her to her parents. They threw their arms around her, weeping and kissing. Then they grabbed me and hugged and kissed me. I was embarrassed. You know, uh, 
no boy wants to be kissed by a lot of older men and women. So I quickly uh, returned to my tube and continued down the river. As he thought about what had happened, I realized, he said, I had participated in saving a human life. Heavenly Father had permitted me, a deacon, to float by at precisely the time I was needed. That day, I learned that God, our Heavenly Father, knows each one of us and permits us to share His divine power to save. At age 16, Tom was expected to forego swimming and fishing in the Provo River and work full-time during the summer. He got a job at Burton Lumber and Hardware Company unloading boxcars of cut lumber in 100 degree temperatures. At this time, America had entered World War II and U.S. combat efforts were not going well overseas. It was during this bleak time that state patriarch Frank Woodbury placed his hands on 16-year-old Tom Monson's head and conferred a truly prophetic patriarchal blessing. You shall be indeed a leader among your fellows, the patriarch said. Seek the Lord in humility to guide and direct you in the high and holy callings unto which you shall be called. In 1944, Tom enrolled as a freshman at the University of Utah. Shortly after, at a university dance, Tom first saw the young lady who would become his wife. Tom had taken a girl from West High and they were dancing to the popular song Kentucky when Francis Johnson and another young man danced by. I caught a glimpse of her, Tom said, but he didn't see her again that evening. About a month later, while waiting for the streetcar at 13th East and 2nd South, he saw Francis and another girl standing together. They were with a grade school acquaintance of Tom's named Paul Wilkinson. Tom walked up to Paul and said, Hello, old friend. How are you? It worked. As I said goodbye, Tom recalls, I quickly took out my student directory and underlined the name Frances Beverly Johnson. That evening, Tom called her and arranged their first date. As my mother was contemplating, is this really the man that I want to marry? It was cute as my mother shared with me how her mother said, you look at the way Tom takes care of his grandfather because my father did love his grandfather and he would shave him and he would get his clothes ready. Any man that takes care of his grandfather the way Tom takes care of his grandfather will be a wonderful husband. And that became a big selling point in my father's favor. Tom and Francis' first date was to a dance at the Pioneer Stake Gym. More dates followed, but as spring turned to summer in 1945, Tom realized his days as a civilian were numbered. On October 6, 1945, Tom went to the train depot in Salt Lake City to ship out for basic training in San Diego as a member of the United States Naval Reserve. Among those saying goodbye was John Burt, a member of the bishopric who handed Tom a copy of the missionary handbook. I'm not going on a mission, Tom protested. Take it along, Brother Burt said. It may come in handy. Upon arriving in San Diego, Tom had his first taste of military life. The naval base seemed to stretch for miles, Tom recalled. I'm convinced the training was designed to toughen us as well as humble us. It succeeded. One night before returning home for Christmas leave, Tom and his fellow sailors were lying on their bunks nearly asleep. Suddenly a man in a nearby bunk, Leland Merrill from Murray, Utah, said, I'm sick. I'm sicker than I've ever been. Tom suggested he go to the dispensary and have a doctor look at him. Merrill said he would be kept for observation and not allowed 